The National Desk, America's News, now. I'm in this to complete the job I started. Taking tough questions about his political future, why the president is adamant that he'll remain the Democratic nominee. We must do everything for Ukraine to prevail. The NATO summit comes to a close. What progress was made this week regarding additional aid to Ukraine? And a difficult process why many borrowers haven't received student loan forgiveness despite several promises. From the nation's capital, this is the National Desk, America's News Now. Thank you for joining us. I'm Dee Dee Gatton. And on this weekend edition, we take a look at the big headlines of the week and we look ahead at what to expect, starting with the four big stories we've been following this week. Arkansas pushing to get abortion rights on the ballot, the November ballot, what the measure is looking to prevent. And should top elected officials be able to buy stocks? Some senators think they know too much. Also, more bad news for home buyers why economists believe numbers won't fall for a couple of years. And check your cabinets. Women who use tampons could be exposing themselves to toxic metals. On Thursday, President Biden addressed the press as he fights to keep his re-election campaign alive. He responded to what it would mean to his legacy if he loses to Donald Trump after saying Trump is unfit for office. I'm not in this for my legacy. I'm in this to complete the job I started. The president went on to tout his economic accomplishments and his pro-union record. The next couple of days could make or break the president's re-election campaign. As the National Desk, Matt Gelka tells us President Joe Biden is feeling the heat from both Democrats and Republicans now. The president hasn't been able to shake the calls to reconsider his campaign in the two weeks since his debate performance opened up his own political Pandora's box. As painful as this is, as much as I respect Joe Biden, as much as I love the work that he's done as a president and as a senator for decades, we need a change. We need a change so that we can win. Vermont Senator Peter Welch became the first Democratic senator to call on Biden to end his bid for a second term. Representatives Brad Schneider and Hillary Skolton formally added their names to the step aside list, with Skolton posting on social media, for the sake of our democracy, he must pass the torch. New polling numbers out Thursday show most Democratic voters want the president to call it quits. The ABC News Washington Post poll showed a deadlocked race with Biden tied with Donald Trump among registered voters. But the same poll had 67 percent of people saying Biden should step aside, including 56 percent of Democrats. Throughout this week, as House Democrats, we have engaged in a process of talking to each other. Those conversations have been candid, comprehensive and clear eyed. And they continue. Meanwhile, Republicans want to turn up the heat on the president if he stays in the race. House Oversight Committee Chair James Comer subpoenaed three Biden aides to testify on the president's mental ability. These are the three people that have been uh, trying to cover up the fact that Joe Biden uh, hasn't been mentally or physically able to perform the job of president, much less to run for an additional four year term. And President Biden is expected to sit down for another high stakes interview on Monday night on NBC with Lester Holt. Meantime, as former President Donald Trump gears up to officially accept the Republican nomination, a new poll shows he's unpopular with two voting groups. The AP Newark polls find about seven in 10 black Americans have an unfavorable view of Trump, as well as about half of Hispanic Americans. Support from those two voting groups could be helpful to the former president. This is he's hoping to capitalize on the growing disapproval of President Joe Biden. Former presidential candidate Nikki Haley revealed she's releasing her delegates to the Republican National Convention and she's urging them to support Donald Trump. The move comes after she stated back in May she would vote for the former president despite their differences. According to CNN's delegate estimate, Haley earned 95 delegates during the primary process. It is important to note estimates don't always translate directly to how delegates vote during the convention.
New developments on an effort to get an abortion rights measure on the November ballot in Arkansas. State election officials rejected petitions this week, saying they did not have all the required information regarding paid signature gatherers. The measure looked to prevent the state from passing laws that banned abortion in the first 20 weeks of pre pregnancy. The group pushing for the issue says it is its legal team is reviewing the state's decision. Seven states are suing to block the Biden administration from expanding non-discrimination rules to include transgender people. Arkansas, Idaho, Iowa, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Utah have joined Missouri's new lawsuit. Missouri Attorney General Andrew Bailey says the new rule forces health care providers to perform harmful gender transition procedures and forces states to pay. The rule was supposed to go into effect last week, but a preliminary injunction was issued in another federal case. President Biden met with Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky. Zelensky was in Washington, D.C. for this week's NATO summit, pleading for more military aid in their ongoing war with Russia. Here's the National Desk, Kayla Gaskins. Ukraine will prevail. Following Thursday's meeting with President Zelensky, President Biden announcing a new security systems package for Ukraine. We show the world that we stand with Ukraine now and in the future. This comes as NATO leaders gather for a summit in Washington, where most of the discussions have centered around Ukraine, which is not a NATO member, and their fight against Russia. We must do everything for Ukraine to prevail. And making sure that we can stand up to Putin's aggression. Secretary of State Antony Blinken announcing a coalition of NATO countries are finally sending Zelensky long sought after F-16 fighter jets. As we speak, the transfer of F-16 jets is underway, coming from Denmark, coming from the Netherlands. And those jets, those jets will be flying in the skies of Ukraine this summer to make sure that Ukraine can continue to effectively defend itself against the Russian aggression. As NATO allies largely unite behind Ukraine, support among U.S. lawmakers remains more complex. Zelensky visiting Capitol Hill Wednesday, sitting down with a bipartisan group of congressional leaders. Since Russia's invasion, the U.S. has authorized around $175 billion in assistance, according to the Council on Foreign Relations. Some GOP lawmakers, like Utah Senator Mike Lee, are highly skeptical of sending even more U.S. resources. Well, Americans are pinching pennies. We're sending our tax dollars to fight in a faraway war. Our defense industrial base and dwindling stockpiles demonstrate that there are practical limits to what the U.S. can reasonably do for Ukraine. Ukraine is still striving to join NATO. This week, the 32 member countries officially declared Ukraine is on an irreversible path to membership, but only after the war with Russia ends. In Washington, I'm Kayla Gaskins reporting for the National Desk, America's News Now. And U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland will not be forced to pay a daily $10,000 fine. This after House lawmakers failed to pass a resolution that would require him to do so until he turns over audio of President Biden's interview in his classified documents case. House Republicans sent a subpoena for the audio, but President Biden claimed executive authority, which prohibited its release. Just because it went down the first time doesn't mean it can't actually pass second time. We do believe that we have the votes. And as we've reported, the House previously voted to hold Garland in contempt of Congress. House Republicans are also investigating special counsel Robert Hur's decision not to charge the president in the classified documents case. On Capitol Hill, a bipartisan group of senators is pushing a plan to ban top elected officials from buying stocks and some other financial assets. The law would apply to the president, vice president and members of Congress and spouses and dependent children starting in 2027. It would also prevent lawmakers from offloading stocks 90 days after the law's enactment. As cleanup continues in Texas after Hurricane Barrel hit, the Biden administration announced new flood risk standards for public buildings. The Federal Emergency Management Agency says places like schools, hospitals, police stations, sewage treatment plants and bridges have to either be elevated above the expected height of a flood or be built in a safer location. FEMA officials say the goal is to avoid rebuilding taxpayer-funded structures in the same high-risk locations. 
One of President Biden's biggest campaign promises back in 2020 was to forgive all federal student loan debt from public colleges and universities. But millions of borrowers are still waiting for that helping hand. Emma from the Fact Check team is here to discuss. Let's start with the numbers. How many people have actually had their loans forgiven so far? So 4.75 million people have had their federal student loans partially forgiven, which might seem like a lot, but that's out of 44.5 million borrowers. So only about 10% have gotten some relief from the Biden administration at good, this point. Good to keep that perspective. Why have only a small percentage of borrowers been forgiven? Yeah, it's safe to say it's been a pretty bumpy road for the Biden administration when it comes to actually getting this plan going. They faced a ton of pushback from the courts on the state and federal level, eventually leading to the Supreme Court striking this plan down. So in the midst of all of that, only a certain number of borrowers who met certain eligibility standards were able to get the go ahead and have their debt forgiven. But Biden does have a plan B and started taking applications for this new plan that's actually geared towards public servants. All right, Emma, thank you. And later on, Emma will be back to break down what it takes to be eligible for this new student debt forgiveness plan and how difficult the process is to get approved. For the first time, the Federal Trade Commission has barred a digital platform from hosting users under 18. In a new settlement, the FTC says controversial anonymous messaging app NGL violated child privacy and consumer protection laws. Federal regulators say the app tricked users into paying for subscriptions and collected data on kids under 13 without parental consent. The maker of the app also agreed to pay nearly $5 million to affected users. They say they view this resolution as an opportunity to make their platform better. Ahead on the National Desk, America's News. Now, Democratic lawmakers calling on Biden to drop out of the race. The new poll revealing what voters are thinking. And lawmakers are sounding the alarm about exploited migrant children. Coming up, hear what whistleblowers are saying needs to be done. Former President Trump is pulling ahead in some polls as calls for President Biden to step aside and end his reelection bid increase. Joining Jan Jeffco to discuss is the president of RMG Research pollster and analyst Scott Rasmussen. We know some big money in the Democratic Party wants Biden to drop his reelection campaign. You know, we've heard from lawmakers, but what do Democratic voters want and what is the likelihood we would see President Biden actually step aside? Well, those are two different questions. In terms of what Democratic voters think, we're doing our first survey at RMG Research on this right now. We're just finishing it up. I took a sneak peek before coming on air, and it turns out that Democratic voters, by and large, still think President Biden is up for the job. They approve of the way he's he's doing, and they don't think uh, that he should be stepping aside. Um, that's something, you know, we're not sure how this is going to play out in the coming weeks. The question of whether this leads him to stay in the race because the elites want him out, as he says, and the voters don't, um, depends on how he does in the press conference and other actions in the coming weeks. Yeah, this is a big week for him, too, with sure the NATO is. summit here in Washington, D.C. You know, a Democratic strategist that was really pivotal in former President Obama's campaign, David Axelrod, said he thinks this race won't even be close if Biden stays in it and that he's going to lose big time, even if the polls show that they're still close in some battleground states. Listen to what he had to say over the weekend. And the president just doesn't seem to come to he hasn't come to grips with it. Uh, he's not winning this race. He's more likely, if you just look at the data and talk to people around the country, uh, political people around the country, it's more likely that he'll uh, lose by a landslide than win narrowly. You know, when I see that clip, uh, he's exactly right. Uh, before the debate, I was saying that President Trump could pretty easily get to 268 electoral votes, but President Biden could win by sweeping the pivotal Midwestern states of Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. 
right now, those three states appear to be slipping out of President Biden's grasp. And there's also concerns about places like Virginia and New Hampshire and Minnesota. Some even think New Mexico might be in play. So it is quite possible to see um, at least a pretty significant Electoral College victory for President Trump if nothing changes. And there's also a few names being floated to possibly take Biden's place should he drop out for any reason, including VP Kamala Harris. What would a Trump-Harris race look like, Scott? <laughs> well, you know, this is one of those things you ask voters to imagine hypotheticals. It's hard to process. They don't really have a good image of Kamala Harris right now. Um, they don't really know what it would be like if she was at the top of the ticket. But if you started just looking at the polls today, Kamala Harris would probably run a few points worse than Joe Biden against President Trump. But look, um, ultimately, that would depend on how the transition took place. If President Biden was continuing to fight it and he was being pushed aside, that would be, you know, a devastating way to start a Harris campaign. Um, and also, you know, normally a candidate wins the nomination by defeating other party leaders. You gain in stature of those victories. She wouldn't have that. Uh, bottom line is, look, there's, there's a solid Democratic base. They're going to vote for either Harris or Biden or whoever is on the Democratic ticket. But the more you move away from Biden or Harris into other names, um, the dicier it becomes for the Democratic Party. And you can view the full interview plus more top stories online all the time at thenationaldesk.com. Republican senators just held a roundtable earlier this week to discuss the exploitation of unaccompanied migrant children and allegations the U.S. is failing to protect those children from trafficking and abuse. The National Desk, Jeff Harris, has more on what a pair of whistleblowers shared with senators. Both whistleblowers really highlighted the failures of the Department of Health and Human Services and the Unaccompanied Children Program. They say the program has allowed thousands of migrant children to be handed over to potential criminals or even gangs. Losing at least 85,000 children, sex trafficking, and forced labor. That's what Deborah White and Tara Rodas, two government whistleblowers, told a Senate panel on Tuesday. I have seen these children. I have interviewed these children, and I have stories that will haunt me for the rest of my life. In my estimation is the most horrific injustices against children that I've witnessed in my entire federal career. Republican Senators Chuck Grassley, Bill Cassidy, and Ron Johnson hosted the roundtable, saying the Biden administration is just shoveling children out into homes of poorly vetted volunteers, setting them up for failure. But the Biden administration has said that the program reunites children with family members. In place since 2003, the program strengthened its rules just two months ago. Unfortunately, children are still suffering, and HHS has failed to get its act together. Rodas, who's had a 20-year career in the federal government, told the panel she worked in areas that processed more than 8,000 minors. To place vulnerable migrant children into the hands of sponsors with criminal history, gang affiliation, to whom many are not even their parents. And White, who was detailed to HHS in the summer of 2021, telling us directly she blames the HHS and the Biden administration's policies for what's been allowed to happen. This is nothing less than taxpayer-funded child slavery sanctioned by the government. Right now, an investigation is still ongoing, but according to the Washington Examiner, investigators hope to wrap up the matter by the end of the year. I'm Jeff Harris reporting from Washington. More bad news for potential home buyers. New numbers from Redfin show the average U.S. home sale price was just under $400,000 in June, jumping 5% from the same time last year. Adding to the burden, housing affordability is at an all-time low, with rent prices seeing an 18% increase in the last year. Economists don't expect these numbers to fall anytime soon, with some predicting the housing market to be stuck until at least 2026. New homeowners who are really squeezing to get into home ownership in the first place and in a very difficult market. So the home prices are near record levels. Mortgage rates are higher than they've been in decades. There's also another concerning indicator dropping by 2% in May, solidifying fears that prices may continue to rise due to low supply. Coming up, triple digit temperatures impacting Americans without housing where families are being moved to apartments to help beat the heat. Plus, a series of tornadoes destroying an entire community in Oklahoma. The agency going door to door to help those without insurance recover.
The National Desk team of reporters is bringing you the headlines from coast to coast. We're taking the pulse of America and we begin in Washington where asylum seekers are having a difficult time dealing with the unbearable heat while living outside. Thankfully, relief may be coming soon. With the sun beating down on the tents and tarps that serve as homes for more than 150 asylum seekers, the shaded spaces inside these shelters offer little in the way of relief. Elizandro from Angola spoke to us through a translator. Okay, it's been very hard for everyone because it's very hard, it's very hot, and nobody can be uh, uh, free. Conditions are tough already as people cook on propane stoves and share limited electricity from generators, but several days of heat has complicated everything. Okay, we are surviving because so many, so many people are coming and donate the water and some food for us. And in the midst of the hot weather, housing arrived. The Low Income Housing Institute, or Lehigh, was able to take funding from King County and help place people in apartment buildings. We're moving um, a few dozen families over the next um, week or so, um, actually this week. So we're hoping to uh, get them out of the heat as quickly as possible. In Oklahoma, FEMA officials are going door to door to help people apply for assistance after a series of tornadoes destroyed their community. Most of the people they spoke to had no idea they could qualify for benefits. FEMA provides assistance to basically three types of survivors. One, those who are not insured. Second, those who are underinsured. And the third are the people who have evacuation expenses. Officials have knocked on about 100 doors a day looking to provide hope for those that have lost so much. In Fresno, California, overcrowding has been an issue for Humane Animal Services. The limited space can leave the shelter with limited options and shelter workers are making a push for members of the community to help out. Doing these emergency foster pushes, um, really trying to get the message out to the community um, because unfortunately when we do run out of kennel space, the only answer in that moment when a dog comes through that door is to have to use a nurse. Adopting a dog can also free up much needed kennel space. The shelter adds that euthanasia is always a last resort. Price hike for bulk, the amount you'll soon be paying for a Costco membership and why the company thinks it'll cut back on sharing. And say goodbye to small bottles of toiletries when they'll no longer be allowed in New York City hotels.
Taking a look at the top trending stories on our website right now, Boeing has agreed to plead guilty to conspiracy to defraud the U.S. It stems from crashes in 2018 and 2019 where 346 people died. The fine is listed up to $487 million. Costco increasing its regular membership fees by $5 to $65 a year. The hike is one way the company hopes to ensure fewer people hitch a free ride on others' memberships. And actress Shelley Duvall passes away at 75 years old at her home in Texas. She was known for her role in The Shining and several Robert Altman films. Those stories and more available right now at thenationaldesk.com. Taking a look over New York City, where soon you won't be able to get those small bottles of toiletries at hotels. Back in 2021, New York Governor Kathy Hochul signed a law banning many shampoos, conditioners, body washes, and lotions that are in plastic containers for hotels and motels with more than 50 rooms. It was supposed to go into effect back in 2023. However, hotel industry lobbyists pushed for a delay so property owners could use up their stock. The ban now goes into effect on January 1st. Cell phones could be banned inside Virginia's schools come the new year. That's if Governor Glenn Youngkin gets his way. He issued an executive order this week which directs the state's Department of Education to come up with guidelines for a cell phone free education. He says it's essential and that the ban would promote a healthier and more focused educational environment. The new policies are expected to be implemented by January 1st. Coming up, a unique agreement why the Parkland, Florida school shooter is donating his brain to science and drug price hike. You may have noticed the cost of your prescriptions going up, who the Federal Trade Commission is blaming and why the role of insulin manufacturers in negotiations is in question. You're watching The National Desk, America's News Now. You can catch us live weekdays from 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. and 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern Time and anytime online at thenationaldesk.com. We'll be right back. The National Desk, America's News, now. Iran has essentially had two pillars of its ideology. It's death to America and death to Israel. Posing as protesters, Iran stoking the flames of division over the Israel-Hamas war. The new warning from U.S. intelligence officials. The collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge is a national problem. Responding to the collapse, who's paying the billions of dollars to rebuild and the economical impacts it's causing? And women's health at risk, the toxic metals that could be found in several tampons. From the nation's capital, this is the National Desk, America's News Now. I'm Didi Gatton, and as the presidential election gets closer, the U.S. intelligence community is keeping a close eye on foreign enemies' attempts to sway the American public. National correspondent Kayla Gaskins joins us from Washington with a look at the latest warning. One of America's top enemies reportedly attempting to stoke discord in American society. On Tuesday, the director of national intelligence, Avril Haines, issuing a warning that Iran is growing increasingly aggressive, claiming Iranian government actors have sought to opportunistically take advantage of ongoing protests regarding the war in Gaza. 
According to Haynes, Iranians are posing as activists on social media, in some cases even providing financial support to the protesters in the U.S. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre addressing the concerns. I just want to convey and, and a firm message uh, from here to Iran. To meddling in our politics and seeking to stroke division is unacceptable. And we will continue to expose attempts to undermine our democracy and our society just as we are today. Both the White House and the Director of National Intelligence highlighting the importance of Americans' free speech and freedom to demonstrate, while adding, it's also important to warn of foreign actors who seek to exploit our debate for their own purpose. Iran has essentially had two pillars of its ideology, its death to America, and death to Israel. Iran isn't the only threat. Intelligence officials also warning Russia is engaging in information warfare. Eroding trust in U.S. democratic institutions, exacerbating socio-political divisions in the United States, and degrading Western support to Ukraine. China reportedly taking a more cautious approach, but still working to sway U.S. public opinion more broadly. The director of national intelligence said this week's warning about Iran is just the first in what will be regular updates regarding threats leading up to November. In Washington, I'm Kayla Gaskins reporting for the National Desk, America's News Now. New developments in the rebuilding of the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Senators held a hearing on the federal government's response to the collapse. At the top of the agenda, who's paying the nearly $2 billion tab to repair it? The collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge is a national problem and promptly and effectively repairing it would require clear and focused action by the federal government. Maryland officials argue the Key Bridge collapse impacts the national economy, not just Maryland. And President Biden requested 100 percent of the cost be covered. But Republican ranking member Shelley Moore Capito says there's emergency relief projects in other states that need funding. We are asking for 100 percent because that's what we've done in the past. And we need it now because we are lending contracts to start the construction now. We don't want to delay this. If Congress does not require Maryland to share in the cost of a project like the replacement of the Key Bridge, which will have a revenue source, how can Congress require any other recipient of ER program of funding to pay their cost share? Senator Capito argues Maryland will end up making money on the project from toll revenue, but Maryland Senator Cardin says tolls must be used for bridge maintenance and that any funds recovered will go back to the federal government. As part of a unique civil settlement, Parkland, Florida school shooter Nicholas Cruz has agreed to donate his brain to science. This unusual proposal came from the attorney of one of the victims, saying scientists may be able to find chemical imbalances that could prevent similar actions in the future. This settlement also gives the victim the right to use Cruz's name in movies, books, and other media. The Federal Trade Commission plans to sue the country's three largest pharmacy benefit managers, or PBMs, which manage prescription transactions for insurers and employers, according to the Wall Street Journal. The FTC has been investigating how PBMs and manufacturers negotiate discounts. The journal cites people familiar with the matter, saying the pending lawsuits target business practices related to rebates brokered with drug manufacturers and that the FTC is investigating the role of insulin manufacturers in negotiations. PBMs contend that their negotiations lower prices for patients. Financial strains are taking a toll on hardworking, tax-paying Americans, which economists warn will affect the country's overall economy. Joining Jan Jeffcoat to discuss is Vice President of General Economics and Trade at the Cato Institute, Scott Lincecum. At the Fed's June meeting, Fed officials discussed this mounting financial strain on lower to moderate income consumers, which could lead to a pullback in consumer spending, as we know. Talk about the significance of this and the toll it's going to have on the economy. Right. So it's a, a combination of inflation and higher costs, uh, along with um, savings from the pandemic, have been depleted. So that leads in turn to Americans uh, having a more credit card debt, which is now at higher interest rates, and that leads to higher delinquencies. So for them, that means a, a that's bad enough. But for the economy, it can be bad because it's, it could mean a broader pullback in consumer spending, which drives a lot of the economy and our, our GDP growth. So if you have that pullback 
in spending and you have a pullback in growth and you could end up with a recession. So certainly not there yet, but it is uh, an issue we're, we're looking out for. Pullback in spending also means perhaps a loss of jobs for some businesses if they start to lose money. In your sure, new column, as, as everything slows down. As everything slows down, right? So in your new column this week, you did discuss this new era of labor market tightness. What is the future of jobs in America? Yeah, it's, it's it's sort of good news, at least in the short term. And it's mainly a story of two big changes since the last decade, when everybody was worried about having enough jobs out there. Um, but today, you know, the combination of an aging population, which means fewer native-born workers uh, to fill jobs, and a lot of early retirements during the pandemic, maybe 2 million or so workers um, that, that left the, pan, the, the labor market early, um, well, you combine that with uh, limits on immigration and not having enough babies, and you have an economy that today is actually short of workers, not short of jobs. Now, like I said, that can be good for workers in the short term. Um, you, you, if you're the only game in town as a worker, that could mean higher wages or more job opportunities. But in the long term, um, it can be a problem. Um, not only do you see higher prices when you pay higher wages uh, and lots of help wanted signs when you're at a local restaurant or bar? Um, but it, in the long term, it could mean less growth and less innovation, less productivity, and then even lower wages in, in the long term. I mean, you think of it like a, you're the only plumber in a small town that keeps losing residents. Yeah. In the short term, that's great. I mean, you have lots of business. In the long term, though, there may be no sinks to fix. So it is a, a problem we should be looking out for. I want to ask you about this lawsuit in California uh, by concert giant AXS, and this is uh, a lawsuit they filed against ticket scalpers uh, and platforms like Ticketmaster, uh, uh, in which scalpers have figured out how to get around the system and buy up tickets that are supposed to be untransferable. So this has been a, a big dispute because these tickets that these scalpers are now buying, they figured out a way to use technology yeah. to their benefit and make them transferable. How's this going to impact ticket prices? What do you think about this? Well, well, we got to start with just uh, tipping your hat to those scalpers in the sense that this is the market finding a way, right? Where there is demand, uh, regardless of whether you're uh, an alleged monopolist like Ticketmaster, uh, the market's going to find a way around it eventually. Uh, but for ticket prices, um, it, it means that, yeah, you'd probably see higher ticket prices as scalpers get those and resell those on the secondary market. But the bright side is it means there's going to be more availability of tickets because when you control prices, yes, you get lower prices in the short term, but you're you're going to have less access to the stuff that's price controlled. You're going to, because everyone's going to stock up or they're going to go to all the different concerts. And it means fewer people are going to be wanting to sell those tickets. So yes, you get some higher prices, but it may mean that you're going to get that Taylor Swift ticket that you otherwise couldn't get at all. And you can view the full interview plus more top stories online all the time at thenationaldesk.com. Women who use tampons could be exposing themselves to toxic metals, including arsenic and lead. That's according to a study published in the journal Environment International. Researchers looked at 30 tampons from 14 brands in the U.S. and U.K. That includes both organic and non-organic products. All were found to have measurable concentrations of at least 16 different metals. However, they say more research is needed to determine how those metals can affect your health. Millions of Americans with federal student loan debt are still waiting on President Biden to fulfill his campaign promise of forgiving their debt. Emma from the Fact Check team joins us to discuss the process of getting student debt forgiven under Biden's new plan. Can you start by breaking down who's eligible for this? Sure, Didi. So under the current plan, which is obviously subject to change, you could qualify for student loan forgiveness if you check any of these boxes that you see here on the screen. So if you're a teacher, if you're a government employee, if you're a nurse, doctor, or other medical professional, if you have a disability, or if you've been making payments for the last 20 to 25 years. Okay, so let's say you meet one of those eligibility criteria. What does it take to apply for loan forgiveness, and also how long is that process? So I called the Department of Education today and got a hold of a blank application, actually. You've got to fill out a lot of information about your qualifying employer and some personal information about your time working there. Once you submit that, they say it takes around three to four weeks to process, and then from there, they make sure that you've made that 
minimum requirement of making at least 120 payments on your loans while you are working for the qualifying employer. And then if you've done that, they do a final review of your application, which usually takes about three months. So if all goes to plan, you should have about four months until you get an answer on the loan approval. Right. Is it possible this new plan, though, gets struck down by the Supreme Court again? I know. Anything and everything's possible here, but legal experts are saying that this plan isn't quite as aggressive as the last plan that Biden tried to roll out, so mm -hmm. it has a much better possibility of sticking. Okay, we'll see. All right, Emma, <laughs> thank you. And for more on this Fat Sheet Team topic, including links to their sources, scan the QR code on your screen or visit thenationaldesk.com. So to come, our team of correspondents breaks down this week in Washington from President Biden's political future to who Trump will choose as his vice president nominee. Welcome back. Our Washington Bureau covers the nation's capital every day, and our team of correspondents reports on the important issues facing the country and how they impact you. President Biden, under increasing pressure from his fellow Democrats to hang it up after this term and end his re-election bid, uh, National Correspondent Matt Galka, the party's been hand-wringing over this for more than two weeks now, with the Democratic Convention kicking off in five weeks. If th is there going to be a plan B? And if there is, it's got to happen soon, right? Well, Steve, it has to happen soon. I mean, I mean, just the math and the timing is is not on the side of the people who do want the president to drop out of the race. Now, we'll start with the White House. If, if you're the White House, if you're Joe Biden and, and, and his team, you would like to burn down the clock as much as you possibly can, because eventually it's going to get to the point where, no, he cannot be replaced. Logistically, it would be a nightmare. There would be lawsuits. And, and how do you get another person's campaign up and running for an election in November? That's a lot of the thinking coming out of uh, Camp Biden. But, but it doesn't seem that there are a lot of Democrats who have left the door open that they're backing down. I mean, we saw the highest profile Democrat so far, former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. This past week, she seemingly left the door open by saying it's his decision to make, even though we've heard from the president multiple times that he is staying in the race and he's the candidate. So it, it, in just a matter of timing and with the convention coming up, that decision has to be made soon. And if you are on Team Biden, you have made the decision. So you're thinking that House Dems, Senate Dems have to give it a rest here and they have to coalesce or, or else all of their fears about not being able to win in November, that's going to be that's going to be even worse if they don't coalesce around one candidate and if they remain fractured. That's not a, a good formula for winning elections. Right. As long as this limbo continues, uh, every event that the president has is going to be scrutinized, perhaps over scrutinized. Uh, and with these questions will continue until we get to some kind of conclusion. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be sooner, sooner rather than later, but we'll see what happens there. Meanwhile, Donald Trump and Republicans will be in Milwaukee beginning on Monday for their convention. And so will our national correspondent, Atra Elnishar. What's on tap for the GOP? Yes, in the greatest state in the union, Wisconsin. Very excited to head back to my home state to cover this massive event where the biggest headline certainly is going to be uh, who Trump chooses for his vice presidential nominee. Uh, we know Trump has confirmed that he's going to make this announcement before the convention, though he kind of hinted he'd rather it be made during the convention to make things more exciting. Um, he also says uh, that what happens with with President Biden, that all the things Matt was just talking about will not impact his decision. He says it's more about the Democratic Party's platform that he's up against rather than the individual. Uh, and speaking of platform, uh, Republicans came out with theirs uh, when it comes to uh, abortion, gay marriage. Uh, was it was more you know you could say moderate than in years past though democrats certainly still see their platform as extreme uh, and we know as is the case with president biden uh former president trump also needs to find a way to win over moderate voters undecided voters nikki haley voters those double haters who don't like the choices before them uh and how they plan to do that so uh, of course it'll be a time for the party to rally around the former president hoping to give him a second term uh but there are certainly going to be some counter programming from the from the Democratic Party uh, and again seeing if those moderates can go to the Republican side Milwaukee 
it's a critical, critical battleground city in a battleground state that could help determine what happens in November. It'll be interesting to see if any of that Democratic counter-programming is focused, uh, at least reporters asking those Democrats about the president, the current president, uh, instead of focus, focusing on uh, the former president, which I think uh, is the goal of them heading out to Milwaukee. We'll be watching all that very closely. Uh, but you mentioned the platform, and in this past, this past week, Trump and the GOP signaling a historic shift on the abortion issue, national correspondent Kayla Gaskins, you covered that. Tell us about that. Yes, yeah, even it has to do with the wording of how they approached the abortion issue or uh, the draft of their platform that was released earlier uh, this week. So for 40 years, Republicans were calling for a national ban on abortion to put a national ban in place. Now that ban, that language was missing from this draft. So that's a pretty noticeable shift. Republicans instead using that to say that they they value family, they value the foundation of childhood and that sort of thing. Um, so this is more in line with where President Trump has been shifting on this issue. So it really is another symbol of where the Republican Party is going and the grasp that Donald Trump has on that party. I did speak to someone from uh, SBA Pro-Life. They're one of the biggest pro-life organizations uh, in the country. And they wouldn't come out against the Republican platform. Uh, they did point to Republicans putting in the 14th Amendment saying that every American has the right to life uh, as something that they were championing. But they also said that they would uh, not mind seeing that language reinstated in future uh, platforms. But Steve, again, this is just a draft. So the full RNC will vote on this platform next week in Milwaukee. Um, and again, it's not binding. Not every Republican has to take this stance on abortion, um, but it is symbolic and it is notable shift from what we've seen Republicans do in the past. Kayla, Atra, Matt, thank you all for your hard work. Back to you. Up next here on the National Desk, commercial buildings converted. The city planning to turn offices to apartments to combat a housing, a shortage in housing. Plus crime concerns, residents in Maryland, a Maryland neighborhood demanding more police patrols to tackle a surge in violence. This is the National Desk America's News Now. We have reporters all across the country in your neighborhoods covering issues that matter to you. From residents in a Maryland neighborhood sharing deep concerns over ongoing crime to efforts in Seattle to convert empty offices into affordable housing. We're taking the pulse of America, but we start in Michigan with a plea to the governor to help alleviate prison staffing shortages. Imagine at the end of your workday, your boss comes and says, hey, we're going to need you for another eight. And then the day after tomorrow, he tells you that again. Byron Osborne is the president of the Michigan Corrections Organization. He also works as an officer. He tells me he's worried about the staffing shortage in prisons all over the state. Osborne says many officers are exhausted. So much so, he says it's downright dangerous. Ideally, we're supposed to be alert and physically rested to do the job we do. These are inherently dangerous jobs, even in the best of conditions. Earlier this week, Osborne wrote a letter to Governor Gretchen Whitmer. In it, he asks the governor to activate the Michigan National Guard to help ease the burden. They need to take realistic measures and approve legislation to enhance the benefit package, in our opinion, to put it on par with the federal prison system and the Michigan State Police. Yeah. 
You don't have to go far in downtown to find empty office buildings, a reality city officials say is a result of the pandemic and a still too slow increase in foot traffic. But soon these spaces could be turned into housing. A city council committee signed off on a bill that would change some zoning codes to make the conversions happen in commercial, high rise and other zones. Mark Angelillo at Stream Real Estate has a project in the pipeline to include affordable housing units. That's if this incentive and additional funding proposals pass the full council. To convert the, the vacant office space um, is a very expensive endeavor uh, from the purchasing of the space uh, to the you know, physical construction. There are efforts by the city and state to make these conversions more feasible for developers like Angelillo. Newly passed state legislation would exempt construction sales tax on conversion properties. We'll have a project that we think makes sense, um, but we need that additional help to make it financially feasible. From Suitland's youngest to the seniors in town and anyone in between. But I live in Suitland, so this is the area that I'm concerned about right now. Dozens of people all came out with the same burning question in mind. So what are y'all going to do? Looking to council member Calvin Hawkins, who organized for help and attention after gunfire <laughs> rang out in this town square neighborhood, leaving a 16 year old dead. A big demand from this crowd was more police patrols. Maybe if they see more police protection, they won't come up here as fast as they do. They're up here all the time. Frustrated to say the least. Assistant Chief Vernon Hale reassuring the crowd it's a 50-50 partnership. The police are the community, the community are the police. We're in this together. All I can say is we got to stay prayed up. Residents holding on for change and safety in their own homes. Still ahead, the stories making headlines next week from a high stakes interview with President Biden to the Republican National Convention. Looking ahead to stories making headlines this week, on Monday, NBC's Lester Holt is set to interview President Biden. The interview will be taped, but NBC says it will run in its entirety at 9 p.m. Eastern. Monday also marks the start of the Republican National Convention, where delegates are expected to officially nominate Trump as their pick for president. Trump says he will also announce his VP candidate. Then Tuesday and Wednesday are Amazon's Prime Day. Walmart and Target are also expected to slash prices on items from electronics to appliances and home goods. The Paris Olympics is weeks away and we've gotten our first glimpse at what Team USA gymnastics will be wearing. The eight Olympic leotards for the women's team were unveiled. They feature Swarovski crystals in a red, white and blue color palette in a variety of designs. The team final leotard is a centerpiece resembling an American flag draped over an athlete after winning an event. The leotard's design team said they were inspired by high fashion and art, paying homage to Paris while also staying true to the stars and stripes. That'll be all for us on the weekend edition of the National Desk America's News. Now, don't forget you can catch us live from 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. and 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern time. Check your local listings and you can also watch us online and catch up with the latest headlines on thenationaldesk.com. Thanks for watching the weekend edition of The National Desk. I'm Dee Gatton and from all of us here, have a great week.